I'd now like to talk to you about the concept of how DNS and uh, Active Directory domain services are related to each other. So you're probably aware of DNS domain name system. Uh, it is the naming services that we utilize for associating names and words with uh, IP addresses so that, of course, we don't have to type in IP addresses when we want to connect to things. Um, of course, uh, DNS plays a major role in the functionality of Active Directory because your domain controllers are going to require uh, DNS to be uh, around for naming all the different services and computers that are in your environment. So if you, if you think about this for a moment, uh, if we look at you know, a domain, this, this being my domain, right? And then of course I've got, I've got domain controllers in my domain that are hosting uh, Active Directory. These domain controllers have to register with DNS based on the name of the domain. So in my case, if, uh, if I've named my domain, let me just move this up here. If I've named my domain examlabpractice.com, okay, then I have got to have a DNS server that uh, can handle that, that naming, okay? Uh, that DNS server is is what we call a zone database server. It will, ho it will be hosting a what's called a zone database. This little cylinder looking thing is going to represent my DNS zone database. Okay, uh, and I'm just gonna I'm just gonna kind of also just kind of color code that to indicate that the the name matches. So so we'll make this the color red, and we will put that around this border here just to indicate that the name matches that database. Okay, so that database would be called examlabpractice.com. Uh, and then so all of your, your client computers, all of your servers, all the different services that are in your environment, okay, these being my client computers and maybe I've got, uh, you know, some servers over here like a, a file server or something like that they are all going to register their names dynamically into DNS. This is why DNS is sometimes referred to as dynamic DNS. All right, and then what happens is, is when uh, computers want to communicate with each other, they will query DNS uh, and ask what the IP address is for the, the name. So when a, a user types in the name of a computer, that's how they locate the IP addresses automatically. When a client computer wants to authenticate the domain controller, it'll do the same thing. It'll actually query uh, DNS and say, hey, DNS, what is the address of uh, domain controllers? And DNS will actually return back a list of domain controllers. It'll put it in the order closest to where you're at based on your IP address uh, and site, and then the user will get authenticated with that domain controller using Kerberos. And so that is the, the general common way that this occurs, okay? Now let's look at uh, how DNS would work in a, a multiple locations, multiple site environment. Um, you could probably imagine that you, you probably are going to have more than one uh, DNS server. In fact, another question that sometimes people uh, look at with this is they, they try to make a decision on whether or not your DNS server should also be integrated with your domain controller. And to be honest with you, the answer to that question is usually yes you do want uh, your DNS server to be a domain controller. You may not necessarily make every domain controller run DNS, but you definitely want your DNS servers to be domain controllers uh, for a special reason that I'm going to explain here in just a moment. So I'm just going to go down here a little bit. We're going to create um, some locations, and we'll talk about how all this is going to work. All right. So let's create some sites. These uh, little ovals are going to represent sites here. All right, let's kind of clean this up. Sites being uh, geographic locations of your company. Uh, and maybe this is going to be New York. Uh, maybe this is going to be Dallas, Texas. Maybe this is going to be uh, our Birmingham, Alabama location. All right. Um, all right, so maybe you've got your, your connections that connects these sites together. Uh, WAN lines or whatever. Maybe New York is like our corporate headquarters. And so we think about DNS. Let's, let's bring DNS in here. Hold on. Let's copy this. We got one, uh, let's say one DNS server here in New York. And of course, then we've got computers in all of our locations. So we've got computers in New York. We've got computers in Dallas. We've got computers in Birmingham. We might even have some servers in each one of these locations and your clients need to be able to authenticate with Active Directory. 
You've also got the, the situation of your, where your domain controllers are. You may have domain controllers in each one of your locations. Um, and these computers have to authenticate. Now, there's a problem in this diagram, and the problem is, is that there's only one DNS server right now. So uh, in order for your computers to log on, they have to locate their domain controllers. That basically means uh, no problem for New York because they've got a, a DNS server right there, right? So they can query DNS, and then they can go and query the domain controller. No problem. But in Dallas, they've got a perfectly good DNS server right here. They're going to have to, their con connections are going to have to travel up to New York just to learn what the IP address is of the domain controller in Dallas. Same thing for Birmingham. So that's a, a concern. Most of the time, what you're generally going to want to do is you're going to want to make sure that there is a, a DNS server in each one of your locations. That's probably the most common way to do it. The, the next thing, though, or the next question that comes up here is that uh, when you have multiple DNS servers, um, what type of database? So there's different types of databases. Um, so you've got what is called an, an active uh, directory uh, integrated integrated uh, primary. All right, that's uh, the first type of common one that we've got. Uh, you've got what is called a standard primary. Okay, you've got what's called a standard or just secondary. Usually people just call it a secondary. And then you've got what is called a stub, all right, which can actually be ADI or can be standard, which I'll get into that, what a stub is in a bit. But um, with Active Directory, the preferred database type is this one right here. You, In a perfect world, you want all of your databases, these guys here, to be Active Directory integrated primary. Um, and the reason is because uh, if you choose this option, Active Directory will handle replicating your databases for you. It'll also encrypt everything. Everything gets encrypted. Uh, it bases its replication on the same schedule that Active Directory handles things on. Um, and this has been recommended since the year 2000 when Active Directory came out. However, you can go with the older format, standard, primary, and what are called secondaries. But I'll explain that more in a minute. So if we make every one of these an ADI primary, there's a rule. Okay, there's a rule. And the rule is that you can only have an ADI primary if all of your DNS servers are also domain controllers. So that basically means that each one of these would also have to be a DC. So when the question comes up, should I make my DNS servers domain controllers, the answer to that question is usually yes. And the reason that it's usually yes is because if you don't have your DNS servers as domain controllers, you cannot use uh, this option here, which is the preferred. Okay, now what if you don't want to do that? What if you don't have domain controllers in every one of your locations or whatever? Could you do the standard uh, uh, method? You could. Um, the standard primary and secondary method is, is something that's been out since the beginning of DNS. It's a, the original type of database. With standard primary, though, you can only have one primary if you go that route. And so that is one of the complaints about this. If you do a standard primary, you only get one primary. Everything else must be a standard secondary in this case, or what's called a stub. All right. Oh, I did not mean to do that. Hang on. I wanted to copy this actually. All right. So let's get rid of that. Paste this right here. Okay. Actually, I'll move it down here. And then same thing here. We make this a secondary. All right. So if we go that route, Here's the problem with that. Only New York is writable at that point. See, because you can only write to a primary. Primaries are writable, secondaries are not. So that means that um, uh, whenever something changes, like if this DC changes something, it's got to have that written up here, and then that's got to be replicated down here. So when things get changed, you end up, you can't, this is read only, and so everything that changes must happen on the primary and it has to replicate now. So that means that there can be a delay. If the IP address of this DC changes, it's got to replicate up here, 
and then, or it's got to send the change up here, and then this guy's got to send it down here just so these clients are going to know about it. So that's one of the, the main reasons why using a uh, using standard the standard method is not good. Now, do you want to know a, a real reason why some people use it? It might be because they completely host their DNS with Linux uh, or Unix, and so they're not using Microsoft servers for their DNS, and so they're using standard. And so that's how you would get away with that if you needed to. But to be honest with you, almost no company, and I've, I've been working with Active Directory since it came out, actually before it went live, since the beta days in the 90s, I've been working with it, and I've never seen a company really ever go that route. It's generally always going to be ADI primary. That's where most companies uh, go with it. At least that's been my experience. Okay. Um, now the last type of database... Let me switch these back real, back real quick. The last type of database that uh, you'll see there is called a stub. Uh, and you're not usually going to use a stub within the same domain. Stubs are, are generally, uh, stub zones are going to be used in situations where you have multiple domains. So, for example, let me just draw another uh, triangle over here, a little smaller, and we'll call this otherdomain.com, okay, just for lack of a better name. Maybe we've got a trust relationship or something between the two domains. Okay, they've got uh, domain controllers, just like we do, that they're hosting. And they've got a DNS server over there. And the DNS server, we're going to paint it blue. Okay, put a little blue border around it here. All right, and at that point, um, you know, they've got their own clients. They've got their own servers. And occasionally our, let's say that our clients occasionally have to connect to servers that are over in that other domain. So this file server here, okay? So, so we'll call this, um, we'll call this file server two dot other domain dot com. That's going to be the name of that file server, okay? So the problem right now is if a client sits down here in our domain and they type in fs2.otherdomain.com it's going to query our DNS server and the DNS server is going to reply back with you know a, a message saying sorry I can't help you I don't know the address of that okay so how do we deal with that all right one option is we can do something called conditional forwarding conditional forwarding means we can add a name here that's for otherdomain.com just send everything over to this uh, the IP address of this DNS server. So I could put that over here and I could say forward anything involving that name um, from here to here. But if this address ever changes, then this server is not going to know what the new address is. So the best way to handle that is to do something called a stub zone. Okay, And um, so let me just, I'm going to make my DNS server a little bit bigger here. DNS. Okay. Move this up, make it bigger, and so now what we're going to do is we're going to copy and paste this here and there, and then we'll copy this in there. All right, now, when we do this, we could do a full-blown secondary, and they would replicate with each other, but you'd be replicating the whole database. You don't really need the whole database. Um, what you can do is a stub. So this this right here would be an ADI primary, okay? But the stub, this guy here would be a stub. All right, and if you did a stub, then all that does is that just replicates information about what his address is all the time. If his address ever changes, his IP address ever changes, he's always going to let the stub know. So now what would happen is this computer could say, I need to go to fs2.otherdomain.com, the stub would know this DNS server's address. It would reply back. The client machine can then connect over, as long as there's connectivity, can connect over to the DNS and say, hey, what's the IP address of fs2.otherdomain.com? He would reply back, and then at that point, the client would know the address of that file server. That's what the stub is going to do. So a stub is a partial... Uh, uh, database of that other zone database over there. It's not a full copy, it's just a partial copy and it is used so that if you've got multiple domains in the mix it allows one domain to find the other domain uh, uh, the other domain's information. Um, and you can do the same thing over here. I could create a stub of this database over here. I'm not going to draw that out but you could if you want to. 
All right. All right, so hopefully that now gives you a, a decent visualization of uh, how the Microsoft uh, DNS can kind of kind of correspond across in a single domain with multiple sites, as well as the concept of having uh, multiple domains. This is John Christopher. I hope you enjoyed that video, and I want you to know that I'm trying really hard to grow this channel, so I hope you'll give me a like and a subscribe. Also, if you'll check the description in this video, I've got a link for you that can show you how you can get access to all my different courses. I have lots of different Microsoft certification courses that'll help you pass your exam. All right, thanks a lot for watching the video, and I hope to see you again. <laughs>